Stanford University. Hello, everyone. It's such an honor to be here with you today. I'd like to start with a quick video. Prevention of HIV, it begins with me. Hello, what can I do for you? Doctor, I've heard a lot about HIV, but I don't really understand what it is. Could you explain, please? Sure. It's a very serious health topic. HIV stands for human... This is the story. This is the story. This is the story of a breakthrough. Breakthrough in the global fight against HIV and AIDS. This is the story. This is the story. This is the story of a new approach. A new approach to prevention. Prevention. That outperforms anything else in the world. And is designed for those who need it the most. In their own language. In their own language. And respecting their culture taboos. This is a story of pedagogically grounded. Pedagogically grounded. Evidence-based software from Stanford University. That in a few short years. A few short years has become a movement of more than 100 NGOs. And 30 nations. And hundreds of volunteers. And hundreds of volunteers from around the globe. Who have donated their time, talents, and celebrity to the movement. This is the story of millions of boys and girls. Men and women who, for the first time, know how to prevent HIV and AIDS. This is the story of Teach AIDS. But this story has just begun. Our vision is to provide this life-changing software free. Free. To everyone in the world who needs it. In the next five years. But we can't do that without your help. Without your help. Without your help. Because this story is also about you. And what you do right now. Last month, these young girls in high school received HIV education for the first time. And after going through the materials, they said they now wanted in the future, when they selected their husbands, to ask them to go get tested for HIV before they got married. So sessions like this don't happen as often as we would like. And the reason for that is that providing HIV education in different parts of the world is actu actually extremely difficult. So there are 33 million people around the world that are infected with HIV, and 95% of them live in the developing world. And the challenges around providing HIV education from country to country vary significantly. So it was in 2005 that I started reading these reports coming out of India which said it was to be the next hot zone for people living with HIV, and that despite spending millions of dollars on awareness campaigns, that the knowledge levels were still very low. I wanted to understand what was not working. One of the biggest challenges was that this link between awareness campaigns and knowledge gains was and still is actually broken. Talking about topics like HIV, meant also talking about sex, intravenous drug use, death, and other topics which are considered taboo in different parts of the world. So unlike, say, some uh, anti-smoking campaigns, an increase in awareness did not necessarily mean that there was an increase in gains in knowledge. So although hundreds of millions of dollars were poured into HIV-related campaigns around the world, it did not necessarily mean that people were learning. The most difficult part was not just the campaigns, but providing comprehensive HIV education, which is what was really needed. And that was extremely difficult, and in some cases, even impossible. Here's a picture of a demonstration from one of the largest states in India called Uttar Pradesh. It has a two-thirds the population of the United States in this one state alone. And what they're burning are HIV education materials. The people doing the burning are the educators and teachers themselves that had been given the materials to be able to teach their young people. It turned out in India that sex education had been banned across multiple states in the country. And because AIDS education was taught as part of sex education, it was either watered down or not given. But even in places like this, 
where it was not explicitly banned. As you can see, it was difficult to teach about. It was rejected by parents as well as educators and, and deemed inappropriate for the population. So as a result, when we ran our baseline studies, we actually found the exact same results as what the earlier reports that I had read were saying and what the press were saying. That despite all this money, there was limited knowledge and particularly about issues around transmission. So what we were wondering was, what can we do? Could there be a way to reimagine how we provide education on such taboo topics? And was there a way to be able to overcome some of these cultural barriers and roadblocks along the way? So here at Stanford University, we brought together a number of inter interdisciplinary experts, and we put our brains together and we started to do the testing and iteration to see what we could do. One of the very first important steps that we looked at was to understand the combination of clarity and comfort. So here you'll see a number of HIV education related pictures that have been used. And on the bottom right, you see stick figures, which are extremely comfortable to look at, but you don't really understand what's happening in these pictures. <laughs> exactly, it's too simple, right? There's not enough information. But the top left are medical illustrations where, again, you do understand what's going on. However, a number of these pictures are deemed immoral and they're banned across multiple contexts. So how do you maximize comfort and clarity and therefore optimize learning? We started looking at a number of pictures that were being used in HIV education. And the numbers at the bottom there are how uncomfortable learners felt when they were looking at these materials. And we're talking about uh, young people in high school and college age looking at this. What had happened was a number of the pictures had been adapted from medical illustrations from North America, which turned out to be just completely unsuitable for different contexts. But we weren't too far away, and so we went through a number of different iterations and a lot more research and discovered that we are a few steps away from creating more ideal images. So this example here of breastfeeding, the primary issue was that too much of the woman's skin, the mother's skin, was being exposed. So just by reducing the amount of skin that we showed, all of a sudden, a number of the learners, the maximum number of learners, were comfortable with the materials. Or here, a similar issue where you have uh, child delivery. <laughs> um, it was a similar issue where too much of the woman's skin was being exposed, the bottom half. So through animation, we could show a woman who was pregnant and then through the animated character show a baby in her arms. And here, we took a chapter out of multiple Bollywood movies. So we couldn't show a couple kissing but we could show them come very close to kissing and then the camera pans up the tree and the birds kiss instead. <laughs> and so that actually worked very, very well in multiple contexts. And being able to iterate on this process, what we found was that more than 98% of the learners were comfortable with the materials. And in fact, one of our advisors here at Stanford at the time, Professor Clifford Nass, had said that this was a rate in Disney territory, which was extremely pleasing because we're talking about HIV in AIDS education. We also found dramatic gains in learning and retention with the use of the software, uh, and especially compared to other standard materials used across the world. We were really pleased about this. However, what we wanted was much more. We wanted to scale. We wanted many people around the world to be able to use these materials and see these materials and learn from the materials. But in addition to doing that, we wanted them to love the materials. And more importantly, we wanted them to implicitly trust the materials. Here's a picture of thousands of people who gather every single Sunday to see one man. He's a film legend in Indian cinema by the name of Mr. Amitabh Bachchan. And they get so excited when they come and see him, and there's so much admiration for him and so much love for him. But beyond that, it boils down to trust. And what we wanted was for people to be able to trust our materials. After all, it's their lives at stake. 
In 2009, we spun out of Stanford. We spun the research out into the nonprofit called Teach Aids. And Stanford was very kind to waive back the intellectual uh, property rights to us. And that was very exciting for us because we were then able to go out and be able to do whatever we needed to do to take this out into the world. And at the time, we were, uh, the materials were being used in five countries. And today, they're being used in 82 countries around the world. We started off with uh, wanting young learners to be able to educate themselves. But through the years, what we found is that a number of people across diverse contexts are using the materials. So it's being used to educate the Army, uh, various soldiers in the Army to be able to empower themselves. It's being used by medical health professionals throughout uh, the globe. It's also being used by a number of religious organizations to be able to teach their congregations. It's being used regardless of technological infrastructure. And in fact, the majority of the world that's using it uh, uses it despite having internet access like in these pictures. Uh, the top left picture that you see there is a laptop on a chair and the chair on the table and the table in front of the room for many learners to learn at the same time. And we've seen this instance happen many, many times around the globe. It's being used despite having electricity. It's being used by, this is actually an example of this woman who found a car battery to power the animations in this community. And it was played during the World Cup games in Rwanda to be able to educate learners everywhere. One of the most exciting pieces has been around scaling the animations. And we've had quite a bit of success in India, which has the third largest nationally infected population in the world. And there, despite the ban on sex education, they approved our materials nationally to be rolled out to, into multiple schools across the entire country. In addition, we were able to bring on 22 Bollywood and Tollywood celebrities who have donated their voices and their faces and their celebrity to make sure that this movement continues throughout the country for all of the kids. And we now have the materials available in seven languages and 14 versions, which means that a little over half a billion people now have access to the materials in India alone. Botswana is another country that we've expanded into where 23% of the population is infected with HIV. So there, with the help and support of our partner organizations, we were able to bring on a number of their celebrities who donated their voices so kindly. Their former president of the country, Festus Mohai, has joined our advisory board and ensured that the materials would be approved formally to be implemented into every primary, secondary, and tertiary institution across the entire country. And they named June 15th their National Teach Aids Day in hopes of empowering people and encouraging them to use the materials and be able to educate their loved ones. A week ago, I came back from meeting the health minister of Tibet, and there we were able to engage their prime minister, who came aboard our efforts, and we're announcing today that the voice of the primary doctor character in the animation is being played by the Dalai Lama's personal doctor, Dr. Seton, who, as you can imagine, is immensely trusted throughout the Tibetan community. So finally, I'd like to leave you with this. There are still millions of people around the world that need access to such life-saving education. The need is great. The taboos are very real. The cultural barriers run extremely deep. But together, with the love and desire of learning, and coupling that with the research-based education model, we can come together to be able to solve these problems. And next year, Teach Aids will be expanding outside of HIV into other new topics in hopes of doing exactly that. Thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.